So, welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Grace Simpkins, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, where I work, which is located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Now this series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, which as you know, is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Now today, it is my pleasure to be introducing you to Ashley Eaton, and Caroline Blake with NOAA's Lake Champlain Sea Grant in Burlington, Vermont. Now, while we'll be talking about lake trout and Lake Champlain, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Ashley and Caroline are coming to us from the Champlain watershed. For at least the last 11,000 years, the Champlain watershed has been the homeland and ancestral territory of the Abenaki, the Mohawk Nation of the Iroquois Confederacy, also known as the Haudenosaunee, the St. Lawrence Iroquoians, and many other indigenous people who continue to call this place home today. We are hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag and the Wampanoag tribe of Gehetaquina. I also want to extend special thanks to our American Sign Language interpreters, Crystal Butler and Michael Hernandez. A few guidelines before I hand you over to Ashley and Caroline. You are all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure that we can hear everyone. However, there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to write them in there as we go. I'll keep track of them. And Caroline and Ashley will stop every now and then and answer a few. We might not get to all of them, but we'll try to answer as many questions as possible. All right, at this point, you are probably saying, enough of that, I wanna hear about Lake Trout and Lake Champlain. So at this point, I'm gonna hand you over to Caroline, over to you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'm just making sure everything is ready to go. All right, so um, my name's Caroline Blake. I'll do more of an introduction in just a second, but today we're gonna to do lessons from Lake Trout and Lake Champlain. What we're gonna be covering is a little bit about freshwater fish adaptations, what life is like in Lake Champlain, how do we use technology to advance research, and how do we track fish? But a little bit about me. So my name's Caroline Blake. Like I uh, mentioned earlier, I'm located in the Burlington, Vermont area. These are some photos of me as a kid um, where I was connected to water at quite a young age. I was actually born in North Carolina, but spent most of my life here in the Northeast. Um, so there's a photo of me on the left out boating and a picture of me on the right fishing. Um, and so that kind of led me to the career that I am as I'm a watershed educator. So my official titer, title, um, is watershed educator. And so with that, I'm gonna pass over the floor to my coworker, Ashley Eaton, and go behind the scenes for just a second. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. So my name is Ashley Eaton. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm showing a couple pictures from uh, my childhood as well. And so on the left, you can see I'm standing there with a, it's a rainbow trout. Um, and that trout is a trout that we grew actually uh, on the pond that was on the, the land that I grew up on. So that was kind of a cool experience. And then in the center there, you can kind of see a little me with my little bowl of treats. I'm not sure what's in that, but I'm camping. And so um, I kind of was definitely interested in being out in nature as a kiddo. And maybe I didn't know this was gonna be the career that I was in as a watershed um, scientist and educator, um, but definitely looking back now, it makes a lot of sense that I enjoyed kind of these moments out in nature exploring. And so I'm so psyched to be here with you all today. So on our next slide, I just wanna acknowledge um, again, the land that we are joining on from this Northeast region. So if you look on the left at that map there, you get that sliver of water going down the center, that is Lake Champlain. And then all of the outlines, those various colors, and um, you can see that they're kind of labeled. Those are all of the native 
tribes from our region. And there is a very cool um, app that you can go to or a website called the Native Land app. And you can look at where you live and see what, um, what native land you're on. So as we begin, I just want to recognize and acknowledge that for at least the last 11,000 years here in the Champlain watershed, it has been the homeland and ancestral territory of the Abenaki, the Mohawk Nation of the Iroquois Confederacy, also known as the Haudenosaunee, the St. Lawrence Iroquoians, and many other indigenous people that also um, still call this place home today. And so we are going to talk about lake trout in Lake Champlain today, um, which was important both culturally for um, all of the tribes that I just mentioned and are still a really important facet of our ecosystem. So on the next slide, I want to ask you all a question. So where is Lake Champlain? Does anyone have an idea of where Lake Champlain is? I just kind of gave you a sneak peek with our native land map, but put in the chat where you think Lake Champlain is. Okay, this is Grace from the chat box. So we are getting a couple of answers and I'm so glad we're doing this webinar because I think you're going to share with a lot of folks, um, maybe surprise them a bit. Liam thinks it's in Alaska. Hannah thinks maybe Canada. Texas says Vermont. Sam says next to Canada. Garrett thinks maybe Boston. Laura thinks maybe by the Mississippi River and Michelle is agreeing with Texas that it's in Vermont. Nazul is, um, saying Eastern US. So we have Hunter says Canada. So those seem to be the guesses about where you are. Awesome, all right, let's go to the next slide. Some of you are spot on. It is here in this Northeast region of the United States. We're kind of zoomed in on a um, political boundary map here. You can see that this circle looks kind of is outlining that long skinny body of water. And this is like Champlain and so it is near it's kind of in between vermont and upstate new york and then it is kind of in ecologically it is connected to the great lakes you can see lake erie's over here on the fringe lake ontario and then you've got new hampshire massachusetts so just to get you kind of oriented so it's a fresh water body in the northeast portion of the united states and while it is um very important it is not as large as kind of some of the great lakes but it has a lot of very um interesting ecological features for being kind of a smaller body of water. And so we're going to focus today on a species that has been um, kind of really important to both the folks living here and the ecological systems and tell you the story of their success. All right, so with a little bit of transition, um, so all of the fresh water body, so all of the fresh water on Earth equals about 3%. But within that 3%, nearly 50% of all fish populations live in those freshwater bodies of water. So that means rivers, lakes, ponds, and wetlands. And so Lake Champlain just falls into the one of those categories. But why do we care? Well, these freshwater fish have to have certain adaptations, meaning they have to be able to survive in fresh water. So there's some key components that they have to do. First, they have to use their gills in order to get oxygen from, from the water, which isn't any different than a saltwater fish, but they have to keep salt inside their bodies. Just like us, fish have salt inside of their bodies that help certain chemical reactions happen to keep us alive. So the fish just have to keep the salt in their body while also having the oxygen from the water go across their gills and collecting it that way. Some other adaptations are that freshwater fish have different migration patterns. It's very interesting. Some live their entire life lives um, in freshwater. Some might spend their early years in a lake or a river, but then migrate to to salt water or backwards or forwards. Um, some just spend their entire lives in a stream. So there's just a lot of different migration patterns that can happen with freshwater fish and they have to adapt in that way. And then last but not least, scientists um, kind of categorize freshwater fish based on the temperatures in which they can survive. So you can see here over to the right, there's kind of three main categories. There's cold water fish, there's cool water fish, and there's actually warm water fish. So just something that maybe you didn't know. But we're gonna specifically talk about lake trout. And so I want you all to take a picture, take a look at this picture and in the chat box, kind of highlight what are some things that you notice that maybe make this lake trout stick out? 
All right, this is Grace from the chat box. So go ahead and write in the chat box, what do you notice about that fish? What are characteristics that you can observe? I know you're all really good at making observations. So Theodore says it has a weird bottom back fin. Hannah notices, and Laura as well, that it's spotted. Azul thinks that it has a slightly green tint to it. And um, Sam says, spots maybe that's for camouflage liam sees some spots as well laura notices that lateral line going down the body of the fish so um i think that seems to be hunter says spotted as well i think those are our observations caroline back to you great thanks so you're you're correct with some of them so some characteristics that make lake trout stick out from other fish species um are that you can see some light colored spots. So in this picture, kind of some whitish spots on a dark body. Um, that's, that's a key characteristic of a lake trout. Next in this picture, you can also see that it has a forked tail. Um, so that's also a pretty key characteristic of lake trout. And last but not least, you can't quite see in this photo, but if you've ever fished for lake trout yourself, you know that you should definitely watch out for their teeth. They're quite sharp and there's a lot of them. All right, let's dive in a little bit more and kind of pun intended with the dive in because what I mean is that lake trout have to survive in order to survive, have to live in cold, clean water. So temperatures um, that they like are between 42 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. However, if the water temperature ever gets above 60, they cannot survive. They either have to dive down deeper and go to a different location. Or unfortunately, they might not make it if the water temperature, they can't get to a colder temperature. Again, they mostly live in that deep water, kind of comparing the, the temperatures of deeper water tends to be colder. And then last but not least is they need a lot of oxygen. And so if you've ever heard somebody talk about dissolved oxygen, they need um, quite a bit of it. Let's do some fun facts. So, Lake trout can be found really across all of North America to a certain degree. And so this map, you see the white is kind of the shape of the US and you see some can Canada and Alaska, but all of the dark spots are locations in which you can find lake trout. Um, so again, Lake Champlain is, is over here in this area. Uh, you can find lake trout in the Great Lakes. I think for the sake of the photo, they just kind of made the Great Lakes white but there are lake trout found in the great lakes um some other fun facts is they're the largest of the freshwater char it's kind of a, a category of fish that they belong to and then last but not least they mainly live in lakes like their name says lake trout but they can survive in streams as well as salt water so they're very unique based on where they live in what part of the country why do we care well, they play a really important role in our food web. First, they're big fish, and so they consume other fish. So here's a picture of a dissected lake trout, and you can see that all of these little creatures are little fish that this lake trout ate. And that's a really important thing because it helps the prey population from exploding. If there's too many of these, it can harm the ecosystem and vice versa. The second reason that lake trout are really important is that their eggs and juveniles, meaning small little lake trout, provide food for many other organisms that like to eat them. So it's all part of the food web. So I'm going to pause for a second, Grace, and see if anything pops up in our, our questions. Excellent. This is Grace from the chat box. So go ahead and write your questions in if you have some. One came in from Sam. And that question is, is Lake Champlain um, named after somebody? Great question. It is um, named after Samuel de Champlain, who um, from Europe was the first European to discover this, this body of water. However, like we mentioned earlier, um, there have been humans um, in this area for over 11,000 years of you know, traditional land. Um, and that's why we did the land acknowledgement to, to show that. Yeah, and I'll just share that the native um, Abenaki word for Lake Champlain is bitabok. 
So that is um, another place name for Lake Champlain as well. Excellent. Um, Garrett asks, why do they have the white spots on their body? Great question. Actually, feel free to add to this, but to my understanding, it does help them camouflage and blend in. Specifically, back, I'm not going to go back to that photo, but you saw kind of their body on the top half is dark, where the body on the bo uh, their bo body on the bottom happens to be white or light colored, and it's a way to camouflage. Think about if you were an osprey or a bald eagle, and you were flying over and you were looking down into the water, you'd see that the water was really dark, and so that dark part of the the lake trout makes it hard for the fish, you know, the the bird species to see it versus if there was a larger predator coming from the bottom, when they're looking up, they're looking kind of into the sunlight. And so that white helps the fish camouflage from the bottom. Great, and we've heard about that um, counter coloration in the past with some of the other animals that we've um, focused on. So that's a nice connection to some of our other webinars. And Theodore wonders, how many lake trout are there now? I'm gonna say in, your, in Lake Champlain. Great question. Um, to be honest, no one can count the number of fish in any body of water. It's a pretty tough thing to do, but Ashley's is going to cover a little bit later about how we get those numbers and how do we track them and all those things. But um, I don't want to give too much of a sneak peek because I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of lake trout and how they're doing in Lake Champlain in just a second. Excellent. All right. I have two quick questions then because I know you do have exciting things to share with us. So this question comes from Lucas. Are they protected or can you fish for them? You can fish for them. There is a certain limit each day. Um, so you always have to make sure if you're fishing on any body of water that you have your fishing license as well as know the regulations. But yes, you can fish for them. And Liam wonders, you showed us some of the um, things that they eat but he's wondering what kind of fish those were. What, what do they like to eat? Great question. Ashley, do we wanna talk about it now or do you wanna include it in part of your talk? I can answer it real quick. So some of the smaller fish um, that they would eat would be like alewife or smelt or whitefish. I think the pictures that we were showing you were sculpin, which are very small fish that live um, near the bottom of the lake, which is where lake trout like to hang out in that cold water. Great, and I'm putting that in the um, chat for everyone so they know how to spell Sculpin. Um, but I'm gonna hold on to the rest of the questions and turn it over to you. Great. All right, so in the US, to be honest, lake trout are in trouble. And there's three main reasons. The first is their habitat is being destroyed to a certain degree, just like a lot of other animals and species, both aquatic and terrestrial, meaning on land. And a lot of this has to do with climate change. Again, uh, lake trout need cold, clean water. So if temperatures are rising, that means that the water temperature might be rising, which could harm the lake trout and where they can survive. The second thing is invasive species. In this picture in particular, you see that there's a sea lamprey that's attached to this lake trout. Um, this is a parasitic animal, which means that it attaches to the lake trout and it sucks out, to be honest, the fluid inside of the fish and a lot of the nutrients. These can detach and reattach. And so you can see that this fish in particular has some old scars from other sea lampreys. So just invasive species are harming the lake trout population. And then last but not least, overfishing. Um, that's why there are regulations on how many fish that you can catch in each state is different and each location is, um, but that is a big one as well. But let's zoom in and specifically talk about the history of lake trout here in Lake Champlain. And there's a photo from the past, as well as somebody ice fishing out on Lake Champlain and catching a pretty decent looking fish. So there's a lot on this slide, so I'm going to walk through it step by step. So before the 1900s, historically, there were a lot of lake trout in Lake Champlain. However, the population soon plummeted, meaning it went down quite a bit. And again, it's because of um, their habitats being changed, again, the introduction of invasive species, et cetera. And so when the 1900s came about, there was actually zero lake trout in Lake Champlain. So we progressed through the 1900s and soon we got to the 1970s. And this is where stocking 
um, started. So I'm sure in previous talks you've talked stock, you talked about stocking, but it means where they're raised in hatcheries and then released into a body of water. So fish and wildlife raised them and then introduced them back into Lake Champlain. But the problem with this was is for some reason, those lake trout that were added were laying eggs, but those eggs were not growing into juveniles. We couldn't, uh, the scientists found no evidence that these juveniles were growing up and kind of reproducing and continuing the chain. However, we have some big news. In 2015, it was the first time that wild juveniles, so small little lake trout, were found, which meant that the eggs that were laid by these stocked fish were hatching, surviving, and growing. And the biggest news that I have to share is in March, oops, um, in March uh, 2021 is what it's supposed to say, we just got some wonderful news that we're gonna actually, the scientists are gonna reduce the amount of lake trout stocking, meaning that the population is doing well on its own, that we don't wanna add too many lake trout to it, because if we add too many lake trout, they're a top predator and they can um, affect the ecosystem by eating too many things. Pretty exciting. So with that, one more time, Grace, I'm gonna pause for questions to see if anybody has any before um, I pass it over to Ashley. So this is Grace from the chat box. We did have one question come in from Katya, and you may have already answered this, but is it a, when you're catching them, is it a size limit or a weight limit? Great question. Um, it does, is a size, it's, it's, a, it's a length limit. Um, so they do have to fall into a certain category in which you can catch them and keep them, but it also has to do with how many, you know, there's, I believe, Ashley, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe in Lake Champlain, it's two lake trout per day. Great. And Theodore wonders, what's the biggest lake trout that has ever, like, how big do they usually get to be? And if you don't know, you can always turn it back on Theodore and tell him to research it. I like to do that sometimes, so. Yeah, I don't know off the top of my head what the largest one is in Lake Champlain, the least. I think I read somewhere crazy that um, there was a pretty big lake trout in uh, in Alaska. Um, but I don't I don't know the specific. But you know, on average, they're they're quite big. You know, thirty thirty inches um, is a, is a pretty decent sized lake trout. And Sarah wonders, do the um... Do the length limits vary between lake to lake, or is it the same for lake trout, that whole area that you showed us? Uh, yes, I would say that always kind of look back and see specifically on which body of water. Um, again, they have to have cold, clean water so and deep water. Um, so I wouldn't say that there's too, too many um, places that lake trout can live in the Champlain Basin. There are a couple lakes here or there, but I'm sure across the country, and even into Canada, they all have their own regulations. And Jillian is wondering, you said that at one point there were no lake trout. Where did they get the lake trout to stock the um, lake from? Yeah, Ashley, do you know specifically, other than I was gonna say a generalized from other states, but. Yep, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and there's two pieces of that, right? So they had to find lake trout that were gonna survive in the Northeast. So uh, like around the weather and climate that we have. So we had genetic um, lake trout brought to us from the Great Lakes. So the, the fish that we are stocking are a few different kind of genetic varieties within lake trout, but they predominantly came from the Great Lakes. Great. Okay, we have more questions. I think I told you we have a very inquisitive bunch, but I'm going to turn it back to you. I know you have a lot to share with us and I'll, I'll hold on to them. All right. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about, from a research perspective, how can we monitor lake trout? So someone asked earlier, kind of how many lake trout are in Lake Champlain and how do we know that? And so I'm gonna talk about a couple of the ways that we monitor and sample lake trout here in Lake Champlain. So on the next slide, there are kind of two main monitoring methods that we use here. So on the left is a photo of our research vessel, and this is a photo during trawling. And so trawling, I'm gonna show you a video in just a minute, but it means pulling, um, pulling a net behind to kind of capture fish that are swimming. 
And then acoustic tagging is using technology to actually be able to track movements of fish throughout the lake. So on our next slide here, you can see this is a trawling net being pulled back in. So this net gets pulled behind the boat. And as Caroline mentioned, these are cold water fish. So they want to be down at kind of the bottom of the um, water column. And so this net gets pulled along and then it you can see it's kind of a funnel shape so the fish kind of swim into it they get pulled up on deck and that's how we're able to sample um, for lake trout in a way that's kind of efficient rather than maybe just using like a, a fishing line or something like that and you can see it's pretty heavy they're having a hard time getting the end of this net <laughs> over the cod end of the net over the back of the boat here into the the sampling bucket and so you'll see they're going to dump the fish out there and so that is um, from that trawl that's going to be the fish that they're analyzing for the research project um, and so this is a pretty common method it's also used in the great lakes um, and it's pretty great because we do and generally don't get a lot of bycatch in it meaning fish that aren't lake trout species it's usually just lake trout and then on the next photo so fish surgery how would that be connected so one thing that we are working on is tracking lake trout throughout the lake. And so one way to do that, you can see that we have one of our PhD students here um, and a field technician actually are doing surgery on a lake trout. So if near the mouth, there's a little tube running, we're actually running water through the gills of the fish. Think about um, if you were to get oxygen as in a human, it's kind of the same idea. And so we're trying to keep that fish low stressed so that we can insert a tag so this is a tag that would be used for a lake trout. You can kind of see how big it is compared to my pointer finger here. And so actually they're doing surgery to insert this acoustic tag um, into the fish so that we can then re-release the fish and then map it out where it's going throughout the um, Lake Champlain Basin. So on the next slide, we are talking about acoustic telemetry. So that's kind of the science behind this tagging process. So acoustic telemetry allows you to put a tag in a fish. And then you can see that middle picture is what we call a receiver. And I'll show you how we kind of put those out in the lake in just a minute. But that receiver basically is gonna pick up this tag as the tag, as the fish swims around to various locations. And the ping will um, kind of tell you the proximity to that buoy or that receiver. Um, and then we're able to get all of that data and look at how fish moved. So these receivers are put out um, throughout the, primarily the field season. They can stay out into the winter. There's just a little prep that has to be done. Um, and basically you can see that they're hooked to a buoy and then they're on a line. And the reason they're on a buoy is so that as the water level changes, throughout the course of the year, um, the receiver doesn't get, you know, either, it doesn't sit on the bottom and it also doesn't get, you know, overexposed at the top of the water column. Um, and so those will be out and there'll be a bunch of them around the lake. And what's really cool about that is that any researcher that's using these tags, um, the receiver will pick it up. So it's kind of nice because scientists can really work together to um, research multiple different fish species in kind of, um, reduce the amount of like stuff that's in the lake because um, it can be hazards to boats and things like that, but also allow um, for um, more research to happen, which is really exciting. So this next photo, one thing we're able to use is ROV, which stands for Remotely Operated Vehicles. And this is a piece of technology I'm going to show you in just a minute. I have it here in the lab with me. And it captures underwater footage of fish during different events. And so the footage you're seeing here is a swarming event. So a lake trout um, swarming event. And this has to do with their um, like kind of mating rituals. And so every November, the fish, all the lake trout will kind of come together in shallow areas. And they do that. You can tell it's shallow because we can see the light penetrating the water column. And they do that because they are coming in to mate and to lay eggs and they need a really specific substrate for their eggs. And Caroline mentioned how important it is that those eggs um, survive so that the um, eggs can hatch out and grow into larger lake trout. And so you'll see this, like if you look at the bottom, it's kind of rocky, They're big, but they're big rocks, right? It's not sand. And so what happens is the lake trout will lay their eggs there um, and the eggs will actually fall into the, into the rocks. And this is kind of the key part of the research in terms of the story of lake 
trout in Lake Champlain right now is understanding where lake trout are going to um, mate and lay their eggs to spawn. Um, and so when we look at this video here, sometimes we station ROVs in different areas just to capture this footage. Because by looking at this, and especially without having a human be there, um, the lake trout are acting more like themselves, right? They're kind of um, behaving as they would naturally. And so we're able to observe and see, okay, are they laying eggs here? Um, you know, what's going on? Um, and so that's a really cool kind of method. And so we're able to evaluate different areas of the lake based on that, which is really cool. Um, and this is really neat too, because usually you wouldn't um, be able to see lake trout quite this way. So it's kind of a neat um, perspective. And you're probably noticing, I'm not sure if anyone's picked up, but a few of the lake trout in this video have lamprey actively attached to them. Um, and so that's another piece of information we can look at lake trout and how they're swimming and how the lamprey are. Um, are affecting them. You can see in that bottom right corner, a little fish just swam out. And then this one in the center has a big lamprey wound. So it looks like that lamprey has slid around. And um, so that is, so that's a little sneak peek at what happens underwater. All right, so that was a lot of information. I'll open it up for questions. All right, so this is Grace from the chat box and a shout out to Theodore who's, who, um, before you even mention it, told me that they saw a lamprey attached to one of the fish. So good observation. Um, and all, another observation, remember we've seen some of those acoustic telemetry um, tools before when we talked about Atlantic salmon and we talked about it with whales. So it's another nice connection to other ones. So questions that have come in, um, one question was you mentioned the ROV and um, that you were going to show us. So they're asking, and I think you're going to get to it. So you can say, I'm going to get there. Um, but they were wondering if you were going to show us the ROV. I will show you the ROV right after our little pause for questions here. Okay, great. So Theodore wonders, um, how many fish are killed by the lamprey? Do, does, the, does the lamprey kill the fish? That's a great question, Theodore. And yes, so, and it all kind of depends, right? So because it's a parasitic relationship, it depends on how many fish how many lamprey are attached, how big the fish is, and how resilient that fish is, how much that fish can handle having, you know, that impact. Um, traditionally, like back um, kind of in that 1970s period that Caroline talked about with stocking, um, lamprey mortality was very, very high. Um, but we have um, new kind of regulations around um, controlling the lamprey population. And so now the mortality rates are, are pretty low, which is probably maybe one of the reasons why we're seeing success in the wild recruitment of juvenile lake trout. Great, and to follow up on that, Garrett's wondering how did the lamprey uh, get in the lake? That is a great question. So sea lamprey are considered non-native invasive, which means that they were not always here. They traveled through the Hudson Champlain Canal. Um, so as you know, thinking about kind of the interconnectedness of waterways, um, that was when that canal was put in um, that kind of opened up an avenue for sea lamprey to travel up to Lake Champlain. Excellent. And then one more question that came in about the ROV from Jennifer. And Jennifer's just wondering with the ROV, is that um, something that someone on the ship is controlling? or is it attached to your uh, ship? Yes, that is a great question. So it is something that someone is controlling. So this is the controller here. I'm actually gonna, I'll turn it on. And then when we um, transition out of this, I'll make sure that that'll be the first thing that we do that first demo. So someone drives it on the boat and there is a little screen. It's kind of lighting up right now. And so that's how we see what is happening in the water. And that's kind of, it also has compass headings kind of and some boat navigation features so we can see where we are and decide kind of how we want to um how we want to travel in the water great well i'm going to hold on to the rest of the questions and turn it back to you but just let you know that folks are asking if the rov scares the fish so i think you'll probably talk about that when you talk about the rov so i'll turn it back to you ashley great yeah um awesome so let's check in at the lab let's see what we've got going on okay so everyone's been asking so this is gary gary is our rov and i'll bring i'm going to bring it closer so that you can see and it is a little heavy so this is gary um gary is a new remotely operated vehicle 
for us. And so this is where the camera is right here. And you can see this is all glass. So the camera can go up and around. And then in the back, there are propellers. And so this is how um, it's able to move. And it actually, because it's pretty little, it's actually quite maneuverable. Um, and it can kind of do like 360s in the water. So I'm gonna set it back over here. And it is connected through, through this um, cable. And this cable, I don't know, can you kind of see, kind of see that? So this cable goes to um, this remote. And if you look, you can see a scientist in their natural habitat. That's me. So, Ashley, um, I'm going to interrupt you for a second and ask Caroline if she can oh, minimize yep. the slides so we can see perfect. Thank you. Oh, great. So this is the screen. And if you look at it, it really kind of just looks like a game controller. It's kind of got joysticks um, on the back. There's a couple buttons here. And then the side features allow you to take recordings of to capture recordings and to take pictures. And so I just want to show you a couple of quick features. So one thing that is really important because we are traveling to really deep parts of the lake is that we have lights. And so Gary has a couple different lights. So really ready for those deep, dark um, kind of areas of the lake. And this is something um, that we've been working on in the lab around the question around does it um, impact the fish? The fish know it's there for sure. Gary is very quiet, but as you know, fish are able to pick up, um, they're pretty sensitive to vibrations in the water and sound. Um, and so it is able to kind of disrupt fish, but it is a little bit less disruptive than um, humans, like divers in the water and things like that, that do tend to be a little louder. But one thing we're trying to figure out is can we put a red light cover on it so that the light doesn't impact the fish so much? Um, and this is a pretty new ROV, so the technology is pretty, um, is, is pretty quiet. It's um, the quieter than a lot of other ROVs that are on the market, which is really cool. And then one other thing I'll show you is that Let's see, can you, you can kind of see that I'm moving the camera around in the back. And so the camera can do a full 360, which is really cool. So you can kind of see as I'm moving the camera, I'm able to look up and I'm able to move it down. Um, and so that's kind of a cool skill. If it's something you're, if you're interested in robotics and something like this, um, you may think about going into a field of watershed science so that you can kind of get to play around and explore driving these vehicles. This one is pretty little, but driving larger ROVs and um, automated um, vehicles can be a, a career, which is kind of neat. Um, I'll pause and see if anyone has any other questions on the ROV front, because I feel like that is a point of interest. Yes, this is great in the chat box. So write your questions in. One came in from Katya, but I think you already answered that, and that was whether the fish can see the ROV. Um, so you um, told us that, and you answered whether the ROV scares the fish that came in from Theodore. Any other ROV questions um, that you have? So Garrett says, why does it need white lights instead of red? So I guess, why did it come with white lights? That is a good question. So um, one of the, it's kind of an interesting concept, but not everybody that buys these ROVs is actually using them for research. Um, so we are one of the research labs that kind of got on board with this company out of Canada because their ROVs are so small and maneuverable, but a lot of the other people that have purchased these ROVs are actually using them to inspect very big boats. So to look at the bottom of boats, um, also a lot of municipals to investigate large tanks that hold water or um, infrastructure pipes and things like that, you can send ROVs into it. So um, when we started talking to this company, we were thinking about adaptations that we could make to the ROV um, in terms of the research that we're conducting and how to make it a little bit more um, friendly to the organisms we're trying to observe. And I think that's a really great point that you make, Ashley, that I wanted to just highlight for everyone that Often, if you're doing research, you can do tweaks to the tools or talk to the company that makes them to make it um, better fit with your specific need. And I know a lot of folks, if they're working in the Arctic, might need to do something to make it, you know, yeah. be able to work in a really cold environment, like you said, changing the light. So um, that's a good point for everyone to know. So I'm going to hold on because I know you still have more to share with us and I want to be cognizant of time, but the ROV is very exciting. And actually, one question I, I lied before we leave. Michelle wonders what powers it. And I think that's a great question to answer. Yeah, that's a great question, Michelle. So it's powered, it's powered by batteries. And so we charge it in advance before we head out into the field. 
Um, and the battery will usually hold for like a 12 hour like field day. Um, so usually it's just pre-charged and that's usually a part of the staff, whoever's taking it out is making sure that all the equipment is ready to go for that field visit. So the next thing I wanna show you, I only, only have a couple minutes, but I could not let you leave the session today without seeing some of our lake trout from Lake Champlain. So I have a couple lake trout here. So this is, um, this is our first lake trout. So this is from Lake Champlain. And you can kind of see some of those features that you all noted earlier, the dark upper body, the light colored belly, all of the spots. And then you can really see, it's actually very pronounced, um, is this midline. And I just wanted to make a note because a couple of you had mentioned that, and that's actually really important. That is how lake trout are taking in sensory information about what's happening in the water. Um, so those are kind of, it's like a little sensor for them. And they have that down the whole line of their body. Um, and so this lake trout, I wanted to ask you, Carolyn talked about hatchery fish. And so how would we as researchers be able to tell the difference when we pull lake trout out of Lake Champlain if they are a hatchery fish or if they're a stocked fish? And so I'm going to show you this fish and I want you to guess if it's a hatchery fish or if it's a, a wild fish. And so I'm going to show you, um, this fish is very slippery. I'm going to show you kind of a, a whole 360 view of this fish. So here's kind of looking at the bottom. Pay special note to this area right here and then around. So what are some features that you think may tell you if this fish is a, a wild or a stocked fish? Okay, so this is Grace in the chat box. So there were two questions there. Do you think it's hatchery or stocked and why? What did you observe that made you um, guess or hypothesize one versus the other? So Liam guesses that it's a hatchery fish. Garrett and Theodore think it's a stocked fish. Nobody's yet willing to tell me why they think that. Um, Azul thinks that it's a hatchery fish as well. So we've kind of got 50-50. Um, Theodore is thinking maybe the gills give you some information. Garrett thinks that the color is different and that's what will tell you whether it's a um, stocked or a hatchery fish. That is great. Right. So, oh, go ahead. So, sorry, one last thing. Texas says, um, that he thinks it's a wild fish because it's beaten up and that a wild fish might look a little bit more beaten up. So now I'll hand it back to you, Ashley. That's great, thanks. So I was pointing out this area here because if we look at this side, do you notice that pectoral fin, how big and dark it is? When we flip this fish over, there is no, there's kind of this little pectoral fin. It's almost like if you've seen Finding Nemo, when Nemo's fin kind of grows, it grows a little like um, a little smaller than the other side. So this is a fish that is from a hatchery. It's been clipped. So that fin was clipped before it was released into Lake Champlain when it was probably this big. Um, and that's how we tell when we pull lake trout up. We're looking at all their fins to see if there is a fin clip. They do, as you see, kind of sometimes regrow a little bit, but they're pretty noticeable. Um, it may be hard to pick up um, on the camera, but this is a wild lake trout and I'm going to, this is going to be tricky, but I'll do it for you all. I'm going to try and hold these fish up because someone said something about color and sometimes you kind of can tell a difference. So this, the upper fish, this is our hatchery fish. This fish on the bottom is our fish from um, the lake naturally. So this is a wild fish and you can kind of see that there is a little bit of color, um, a little bit of color different, differentiation, but not much. Um, and so this is a wild fish, just to give you a sneak peek at this fish. You can see it has two pectoral fins, which we're looking for. So you can see one there, one here. You've got your um, fin, your anal fin and your little um, pelvic fins here in the back. This fin looks good. So this is a nice healthy fish. And then the only other thing that we look for, just to take a quick observation, is we look for any big marks on the body. And so looking at kind of where the scales of the fish are, we look to see if there's any marking. And this fish doesn't have any. That means there's no lamprey wounds that we can see. This fish, which you were totally right about, it is a little beaten up, does have a lamprey, um, a spot where there was a lamprey wound. Um, kind of right over here, which is kind of hard to tell, and then right here. So they've kind of healed a little bit, but um, it tells us that at one point 
there was a lamprey on that fish. And so that's it from the lab. Um, I think, Caroline, I have just one slide and then we'll um, finish up and take some questions. Great, so we've kind of told you a little bit about the history of lake trout and where they are today. And the piece that I wanna leave you all with is we are celebrating the success of lake trout wildly reproducing in Lake Champlain but the story doesn't end here. There is still a lot of work to be done around conservation to make sure that the habitat is kept intact and that these fish are still um, able to live in cool, clean, um, deep water. So there's still work to be done, but we're very excited to report out that lake trout in Lake Champlain are um, reproducing naturally. Excellent. Well, I have a few questions uh, to round it off, but thanks so much for that great information. I know that I learned a lot about Lake Champlain and about Lake Trout, and um, I just want to ask a few more questions before we sign off. And Katya asks, can you tell if a lake trout is a male versus female? That's a really good question. Um, so usually we can tell from internal organs. So when we do dissections on the fish, and telling from the outside can sometimes be a little tricky because when we pull the fish up, um, sometimes the females will have very full stomachs if they have um, eggs, but their swim bladder also expands. So sometimes it's tricky. You might look at a fish and think, oh, it's a pregnant lake trout, but sometimes it's actually just a, so it's the, the best way to do it is by dissection to see what internal organs are inside. Gotcha. And I think I predicted this question, but Texas wonders how much did the ROV cost? That's a great question. So this little ROV here um, was about $10,000. Um, and there's kind of a range of, of ROV prices and we selected this ROV based off its features. So that was kind of where we landed. And as we added features, it became um, a little more expensive. Great. And um, Liam wonders, what does he need to do to be able to drive one of those when he grows up? So do you have any do you have any advice? Because you clearly have the dream job. You get to study lake trout. You get to drive the um, ROV. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's kind of two ways, right? You could be a researcher that is using ROVs in your research, in which case you'd be able to use it. Caroline and I were some of the first ROV pilots in our lab. Um, because this was kind of a project that we were interested in bringing to our lab. But another way would be if you're into engineering and design is you could actually be someone that designs these. Um, and like I said before, it's not only researchers that are using ROVs, it is folks that are working on large ships that are doing inspections, folks that are doing inspections of it, like um, different municipal like water pipes and intake pipes and things like that. So it's not only people in the water resources field that are um, using these on a daily basis. Or you could be really successful and be able to just buy a $10,000 ROV <laughs> yourself. Ooh, Grace, I think you might be my And if you are, please invite me to come and um, look around with your ROV. <laughs> um, one question I, I like to end on that came in from Katya, so I'm glad she asked this. And I'm going to pose it. You can take turns, but I'd like each of you to answer. What's your favorite part of your job? I think it's actually pointing to me. So my, I'm, I'm new to this position. It's been uh, just under two years. And I think my favorite part of it, without a doubt, is is doing programs like this. And of course, I would rather be doing it in person, but just reaching a, a wider audience and working with K through 12 students, you all are inquisitive and like asking questions. And it keeps me on my toes of when I don't know an answer, I try to go look it up myself. Um, so I really like interacting with, with K through 12 students and the public. Great, and I'll say, I think my favorite part of my job, because we are funded through NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the work that Caroline and I do is like paired with research. So all of the stuff that we're learning and teaching about is based off the research and the information that's coming out of um, the University of Vermont where we work. And I think to me, that's my favorite because it means we get to be on the ground doing things like driving, you know, driving, piloting the ROV, assisting. Caroline and I assist on a lot of research projects, especially in the fisheries realm, lake trout and lake sturgeon. Um, and then we get to basically engage other people in that as well, which is really exciting. It's been awesome to hear all the questions and maybe some of the interest in going into the fisheries and watershed science field. 
Great. Well, I just want to thank you uh, for sharing your knowledge and sharing your incredible video footage and, and telling us all about uh, Lake Trout and Lake Champlain. We had some more questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to I'm going to stop now. But I will um, tell those folks that were asking about um, other RVs if they come in different sizes, if they do different things. That um, so I work at Woods Hole Sea Grant. We're at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, HUI, W H O I. And if you Google us, I know that we have a many different um, different types of either ROV or AUVs, and there's there's some video footage where you can look around them. So I encourage you to do a Google search and, and look at some of, of the different ones. That's the first time I've seen, what did you call yours? Gary is a deep trekker ROV. Gary, so that's the first time I've seen Gary, which was very exciting for me. So you can go ahead and, and look up and you'll see there are many different kinds of ROVs, that, so I encourage you to do that. Um, so thanks so much, Caroline and Ashley. Learned a lot. Thank you to Michael and um, Trisha for our wonderful um, American Sign Language interpretation. And Crystal, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, it's one of those days. And if you're um, interested in joining us next week, we are going to be um, switching from the Northeast and we're going to be going out to the Navajo Nation in the Southwest. And we're going to be talking about how the National Weather Service uh, works with the Navajo Nation in emergency preparedness. So it's going to be very exciting. Um, so please join us next week for that. So thanks so much. Great to see you all. Have a great week and we'll see you same place, same time next week.